Hi everybody, welcome to Grumpy Old Men. Uh, coming to you from, I believe, and we'll go through this in a moment, the longest beach in Thailand. We've reclaimed the trophy. Um, this is Steve Ross, by the way. Good morning. I'll put you more in the camera. There we go. Just tilt oh, it around a little bit. How kind of you. Thank you. That's very That's generous. That's right. I'll just... Uh, That's very... Yeah. <laughs> we've changed our chairs and uh, Steve was humming just before we started, Oh, what a beautiful morning, which is the opening number, I think, yes, from yes. Oklahoma. Yes. And I can't get it out of my head. Yeah. It is a beautiful morning. That's why I was humming it. They're all, well, almost all beautiful mornings on Turtle Beach, but this morning is particularly terrific. It's just great. Blue skies. Oh. So uh, apart from a lot of other things we're going to talk about today, we will be talking about longevity and how some people go to extraordinary lengths to, uh, to, well, stay alive a bit longer. As to sing from most of us who spend most of our lives shortening mm. those lives as best we can. Mm. Um, oh, did you order a, uh, oh no, that's for the gentleman. We've got fresh pastries here at mm -hmm. Chip Fair La La. And uh, yeah, the, the smell of banana bread is yeah. permeating the air. Yes, it is. <laughs> did they write a song about banana bread? I don't think I'm so. I'm sure somebody has somewhere. Now, we've also found ourselves the most uh, wobbly table in the whole of Tom Leung. Which it's seems, a gift. It's a gift we have. It, yeah. it is indeed. We've also got the duck, Bob, I Bob, believe. Bob, Bob the duck, we've has, decided. Uh, turned Bob up, the duck. And we use Bob to... Uh, to Remind Steve that ooh. someone else needs to speak. Bob's in fine form. Mm. Yeah, oh. the we got the water out of Bob. Yeah. So he's, he's got a clear voice now. Uh, but there's lots to talk about today. Now, the other the, the, the thing I wanted to start with is the longest beach because, oh, no, just before we do that, speaking about, oh, what a beautiful morning, are there other songs that you just can't get out of your head or do you have those earworms that you, earworms. do you yeah. have a different one every day or you have one reoccurring earworm? I do. Uh, uh, it's an old, old song in Thailand. Uh, uh, it's called... Uh, a Thai Sabai, earworm. Sabai. Yeah, by Tong Chai McIntyre. Lin ke fan pokan ti rai ge rung yai. Pa 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 da pa da pa dum. And it was a big hit when I first came here in 1988. And uh, I find myself whistling that in the most inappropriate situations. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it just, that song for some reason for 35 years just really clicks with me. So it sort of becomes an editorial comment in the wrong places. You go, you're going, Sabai, Sabai, yeah. when you're telling them to no, calm down. That's, that's Sabai, Sabai. That's a different Tong Chai McIntyre. Oh, Kukat, uh, Kukat, fighting couple, that's it. It's called Kukat. And uh, yeah, that, that sucker gets, as far as Western songs, what's that one by Soft Cell? Bum, 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 bum. Don't touch me, please. I cannot stand the way you tease me. Bum, 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 bum. I'll be walking on the beach, and that bum, 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 that refrain will go for two kilometers straight down the beach. I won't be able to get Timing it. Timing with your footsteps. It might, it might, yeah. That's yeah, your marching earworms, song. Earworms, earworms. Yeah, those two are my two. Yeah, my marching song, yeah. I have different ones every day, so uh, yeah. something <laughs> sticks in my mind and then it gets replaced with something else. But I, I always do have an earworm. What's your earworms? I'd be interested yeah. to hear. The songs that just go around and around in your head. And more importantly, how do you get rid of them? Yeah, I, I don't know. I my only way is to replace them with another yeah, earworm. Yeah, a different song. Play yeah. a different song, yeah. Turn on your phone and play a different song. It's like giving up cigarettes and taking up Panadol or something. And How would you know about giving up cigarettes? In, in that subject, I am the expert. I have quit smoking a thousand times. At least once a day. I'm really good at quitting smoking. Staying quit is more difficult. Different thing. But yeah, it, it, you can replace... Yeah, you're right. You can replace one drug with another drug. We did make a, a claim a couple of weeks ago we. to, for... for well, I... Where do you get this wee white man? For having uh, the, claim. the longest beach in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said last week, no, 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 it's over in... Um, I said it was Patalung, but it, no, it was 
Songkla and Nakhon Si Tamarat or something yeah. like that. But it wasn't. It was actually had lots of breaks in it, a lot of uh, little estuaries and mm. isthmuses. Isthmuses. So, uh, what would be a collective noun for isthmus? Isthmai. Isthmai, perhaps. So, uh, it, no, it, it, it looks like this, I think we've calculated it's about 19 kilometres. Unbroken. Ooh, wow. There is a little estuary just oh, south wow. of here, but it's only just an estuary. Yeah. Uh, well, it's only there certain times of the year. Uh, and day. Ditto the one up at the, the remain of the tin dredging, which right now, it's very interesting, the remain of the tin dredging, that lagoon is almost empty. And you can see the, the uh, uh, you can better see what's left of the, the, the tin dredger. So we're, we're claiming uh, Taimung and the northern and the southern stretches, which goes down to Kokloi and Natai, as the longest beach in Thailand. And it's up to you to challenge us and provide evidence. Yeah. Us. I don't know where the us comes from, but I, I'm willing to sign on. Yeah, don't I, you want to be sort of living on the longest beach in Thailand? I'm very happy to be living on the beach that makes Steve very, very happy. Uh, if it's the longest, that's fine. I, I sort of feel like, honest to God, this high season has freaked me out. There's just too many tourists here. And, and I don't need, we don't need any more uh, specialness to bring any more tourists. I'm, I'm, this is just enough. I, what would have thought this is like the regular traffic you'd sort of get in a high season? Because I wasn't here last year. Yeah, and last year's the only experience I have of this place in the high season. And uh, it was the end of COVID. And uh, I think that uh, tourism had not yet come back. But typically, you know, talking to my neighbors, it is Thai tourism that drives this economy, not Falang tourism. And... Uh, yeah. This year, we're just seeing a whole lot more white faces around, at least more than we did last year. And, and people are commenting on it. It's not just me. I think local people are commenting on it. And it's a mixed blessing. Obviously. They're coming to visit you. Well, a couple, yeah. But uh, for the most part, they come and they spend money and everybody likes that. But they would seriously just prefer we mailed a check and stayed home. They, they don't really need to have us here, just our money. And uh, yeah, I think it's enough. I think this. this well, you're, you're telling me when we see that gorgeous Thai smile, that it is not tinged yeah. with, with generosity and, and love? The Thai smile is something they keep in a jar by the door and they put it on when they leave the house and they take it off when they come home. It don't, it don't mean. Do, do you think that Thai people are sort of told at school, you know, yes. at assembly every morning, make sure you smile? Yes. Oh, God, yes. Smile yeah. all day. You know, the Japanese paint on the walls of their elementary schools. They'll paint the line at 17 degrees because that is exactly the posture that is required when you greet a stranger. And they teach oh. the kids. They go, go, you know, you go uh, do the line for 100 reps. And in Thailand, it's not that codified. They don't have, you know, paintings of smiles. But everywhere, uh, uh, it is reinforced, you know, social lubricant, get through the day with smiles. Whatever happens, smile. Do not express sincere emotion, any sincere emotion in public at all. And you cover that with a smile. Uh, but, here am I going like this. You mentioned a little bit yeah, earlier, and now I'm yeah. noticing it. What there happened are this week? Yeah. A few more flies around. Yeah, they, they, Our lives are so complicated. This is what makes they, us uh, talk. They came with all the new farang. No, this, you know, every month has a signature insect, and this month is flies. The heat uh, Which, makes them I wouldn't them all call it a, like an invasion. I mean, a few extra flies, but... Yeah, it's th noticeable, that, you know. But that's on top of zero flies, usually. This, this is what we have to notice on Turtle Beach. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't have crime to report. We don't have uh, great discoveries in the arts or the sciences. What we have is every month there's a signature insect, and so that's what we, it's, it's Mayberry, man. It's Green Acres. It's very small and very local, and that's what we've got. Dare we say parochial. Yeah, parochial, provincial. It's, uh, uh, it's a very small town. Now, one thing it does attract is a lot of cyclists. And I was saying Bicycle. yesterday, yes. the reason it attracts the cyclists is firstly, there's that really lovely road all the mm -hmm. way from Phuket. It's about a 20, 25 minute easy drive, no traffic or anything. And uh, they get here and they're confronted with what? About 10 kilometers of long, exactly flat, yeah. 
two-lane two road. Yeah. And I said, the reason they like it is because it's just got this, who wants to go up and down hills? But no, no, no. Well, and there's no traffic. It's a dead end. It's a cul-de-sac. There's no other traffic. There's no intersections. It's perfectly flat, perfectly straight. It's exactly 10 kilometers, so that lets you know exactly how far you've ridden or you've run or you've walked. And uh, it's gorgeous. It's an absolutely gorgeous road. And if you're doing it in the morning, you don't have to pay to go in the park. And so in the, in the warm season, we have marathons here. We have fun runs and fun walks. Oh, that was something else I want to talk about. Well, April 28th. Well, before you get to that, uh, oh, okay. which we will get to, I, when I said, oh, who wants to be See, going look. up See? and down hills? Here they come. Yeah. And, they, and cyclists write to me, said, that's what we love doing, going up and yeah, down hills. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we've just, um, we, we do have an influx of, uh, of cyclists yeah. who There's have a uniform <laughs> of sort of lycra and uh, click clack shoes. Yeah. And, and but that, it's, you know, I, I bicycle this every morning and it's... Uh, do you wear lycra and click clack shoes? No, I wear a button down luau shirt, just like I'm wearing right now. I don't... I wear buttons all the time. I don't wear a t-shirt. Anything I have to pull over my head, I don't wear. You haven't sort of uh, progressed to zippers or, or Velcro? I, I, no, you know, and again, these are the shirts that are sold locally in my size. This is what I wear because I spend my money here on Turtle Beach and I buy the shirts that are available in the Talat. And Where did you get this available. one? At the, the last festival? This was at the New Year's festival. Yeah, it's a okay. little unusual because it, it came it with the New Year festival. Yes, it fits. Uh, but yeah, that I don't. Uh, I I wear exactly what I'm wearing right now at a bicycle, and it is again because the tin mine, the lease on the the original tin mine, Tai Mung means end of the tin mine, and the original tin mine here, the Chinese tin mine, was exactly 10 kilometers. So the road goes exactly 10 kilometers uh, from where it meets the beach down to the remain of the tin dredging, and it's uh, you know it's easy to know you've done exactly 20 kilometers today. It's a great ride, great ride on a bicycle or a motorcycle, I guess. You were going to mention a, uh, a marathon. Oh, April 20, it's the weekend of the 20th. Rather than going, oh, you could go, yes. Yes, Tim, <coughs> thank you for bringing it up and reminding me. Yeah, it, there's a, uh, the, the, a lady at the government reached out to me and said, uh, dear Steve, could you please uh, help us promote our fun run in Bang Tong? It is the Bang Tong run. Uh, there's a walking portion. You can sign up. You can register for different portions. There's a, a kids uh, fun walk and, and it's different lengths. But it's in the Bangtong district uh, around Wat Ra, which is or Point, Ra, Ra point to Bangtong. Bangtong up there. It's up in there. the mountains uh, kind of by Takwapa. And uh, oh, it's a good hour away then. Oh, is it? Well, no, then it's not that far away. Well, Takwapa. Uh, there's, there's a there's a poster up in the Bangkai coffee shop where you can look at it. But she's asked me to help promote this on my channel and, and this show. And I don't know how, she sent me a flyer and a website. Uh, I will ask you to put the link in the description of this for their website, because uh, I forgot to bring it with me. Yeah, she's a good doggy, that she is. Uh, at any rate, I want to see what happens. I want to see if anybody shows up at this thing because Steve Ross promoted it. Uh, and by extension, Tim Long, uh, Tim Newton promoted it. And uh, we, so we're going to put a link in the description there. If you're around this area, if you're in Panga, Phuket, uh, Ranong, and you enjoy running or walking, please go to this thing and tell them you heard about it on Steve's channel and the link in the description. Thank you for allowing me to do that. And there is also a link in the description to Steve's channel. Mm. Um, if you've got nothing better effort, to do. Yeah. Yeah, if you've got nothing better to do. And please look at the Boontongs playlist. I, it, it happened again this week. Somebody oh, came. No. <laughs> yes, again. It's like God just wants these visitors to stomp my heart into the ground. Uh, somebody came and, and they, oh, I want to see the studio. And oh, here's your turtle you're building. And here's the art you've created. And they come to the Boontong set and they say, what is this? Why do you have a dollhouse with sand on the floor? Where's the barman? Yeah, where are it, the girls? Well, well, they're there. They're there. The barman's there, and the girls are there, and I'm there. It's a set. I made a dozen videos on this set. It's a boot. It's called a playlist called Boontongs on my channel. 
uh, go and go and take a look. Buntong's is the best beach bar in Thailand, and it only exists in my living room. And it breaks my heart when people come in and see the set and they don't recognize it. So go look at that playlist, please. All right, I've promoted everything I have to promote. I'm leaving. Thank you. Uh, I had some guests coming in uh, this week, mm -hmm. and the interesting thing, or probably the most interesting thing I've learned, and I'm a newbie at this uh, short-term rental business, yeah. is that every single customer is different. I mean, it seems obvious when you think about it, but that somebody wants you know extra this, or somebody wants this, or somebody. Everybody wants different things, so you sort of just got to be ready for them to be wanting mm -hmm. anything. And anything is okay. You don't mm -hmm. go, really? You just go, okay, we'll, we'll get one of those. We had people this week who kept on calling me up or messaging me saying, we need some more toilet rolls. I thought that's sort of interesting um, because they seem to be going through a lot of toilet paper. Uh, and then I sort of said to them, I said, is your um, bum gun not working next to the toilet? And I went, oh, what's that? Um, oh, we thought that was just used for cleaning the toilet. And th these are people from uh, the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And it was their first... I've heard of that place. Their first time to Thailand. They'd never heard of the concept of... Yeah, there might, th there might be a need for a little sign that says, this is how you use the bum gun. I've had Please aim carefully. Yeah, I've had... And it is, it is useful for cleaning the toilet bowl. Of Sometimes course. there is debris remaining after you flush, there is debris on the bowl. And that bum gun is useful for, for uh, washing that away. But yeah, it, I've had the same roll of toilet paper hanging next to my toilet for the, the 18 months I've lived in the house I live in right so now. So you use it and you put it back. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Right, use right. the whole roll and then hang <laughs> it back again. up there. Because you got to dry it before you can sure. use it again. Well, yeah. Of course. But yeah, it's, it is, uh, and I, you know, because my days are empty and I can do what I want, I, t I take a full-on shower <laughs> every time, every time. The thing about uh, the bum gun in that particular property is uh, it could put out the fire in the towering inferno. It, there's pressure. You've oh got to be careful. And so we yeah. do use it to, uh, to, yeah. to, to give the whole floor in a clean. In any new bathroom situation, you've got to test it first. Don't just aim and squeeze. Because you will blow yourself. Sometimes you'll blow yourself right off that chair. Uh, you got to know the water pressure before you can use the bum gun. Uh, so if it's a new situation, and uh, you know, test it first and see what the pressure is like. Yeah. But they are marvelous. I, I, I will never, never go back to paper. Uh, likewise, oh, gee, the Australian accent just screams out in that from that group. Ah, oh, got I, mate. So, uh, bum guns. So yeah, they, they uh, spent the rest of their time here just thinking sure. that it was the best thing since sliced sure. bread. Oh yeah, you, you've created converts. And they'll go home and tell everybody. Some people go home and they, they, they order it online and, and they install it in their bathroom at home. It doesn't quite work the same though with uh, the cold tap in Iowa in the middle of winter. Not, yeah, January in Iowa. You know, and, and I have said this before on this show, my mother used to rent rooms to college students, graduate students at the University of Iowa. And for a long time, she rented just to Indian students uh, Mudfuds, MD, PhD candidates. They would come for two years to earn a Mudfud and then they would uh, leave and they would turn the keys over to another Indian, an incoming Indian student. So every two years she had different Indians living there and they would keep a two liter bottle, a Coke bottle next to the toilet because she didn't have bum guns in the apartments. And they would just use, you know, two liters of water and keep that. I next thought you were going to say they kept the Coca Cola and they shook it. Well, oh, there's an interesting <laughs> idea, isn't it? <laughs> would, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, so, and it was for that uh, reason, I guess, it could get room temperature in that bottle. If you took it right, right out of the tap mm. uh, in a saucepan or something, then you, you, you were getting very cold water in Iowa. So your aim does get better <coughs> and more intuitive oh, yeah. as you go on. Yeah. But the first oh, yeah. time can be a little bit, oh, what's going on there? Oh yeah, the first time you make a mess. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we've, uh, hopefully you, we haven't ruined your breakfast. Uh, somebody had uh, probably the most uh, important question that's ever been posed to the program during the week. Somebody wanted to know how tall you are. Oh, yeah, I'm flattered by the interest. Uh, I think it's a dull question, it's easy to answer. I have been exactly six feet tall since middle school, 
though now I have not had, I don't remember the last time anyone measured my height. I imagine statistically uh, there should have been spinal, spinal collapse of at least a few millimeters, a, an eighth of an inch uh, uh, over the years. So I'm probably a little less than, a little shorter than six. What is that in centimeters? Like uh, the 16, rest of the world. 16,400,239 centimeters. What about in liters? Four liters, just four liters. Yeah. Four liters? Exactly four liters. I am exactly four liters tall. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, you are taller than me. Though I may have, like I say, over the years, I'm 66. I may have lost a, f a few fluid ounces of height. Yeah. There we go. Let's have a talk about longevity. All right. Um, yeah. We spoke a few months ago, and you've already forgotten, about a gentleman yes. called Brian Johnson. Yes, I forgot. Who was a longevity expert. We were up at the, uh, the little yeah. villa resort, boutique resort in town. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Brian Johnson, he was measuring his Johnson <coughs> uh, on a daily basis, checking his erections. Don't okay. you remember this? No, not at all. Which is God. not surprising. I, if we had had this conversation yesterday, I would not remember it. What? Who are you? What? So, Where are um, we? yeah, Mr. Brian Johnson is an interesting person. He's in his 40s. I think he looks like he's in his 40s, but he uh, has been injecting himself with the blood of his 17 year old son uh, as one of the ways that he keeps himself young. Oh. So <laughs> it's cannibalizing your offspring. Well, you know, honestly, now just a quick aside, uh, I knew a couple in Iowa who had a second child because their first child had kidney disease and neither parent was compatible. Oh. So they had, a, or a, yeah, they had they a got second a spare. child. Yeah, they created a child for the purpose of body har uh, organ harvesting. So anyway, go on. Mr. Johnson is what, what, cannibalizing his son. So what were they going to do? <laughs> They were going to, when the first child mm -hmm. had a kidney problem, well, they were going to remove a kidney from the other child? Yes, uh, but they wouldn't be children. This would be, you know, kidney disease typically strikes in, in early middle age. Uh, and they had uh, genetically determined that one of their children was at risk, at heavy risk for, for uh, kidney failure in, in middle age or late late. Uh, 20s, whatever, 30s. How does that conversation <coughs> go? Hi, da uh, dear, uh, darling. Um, now, you know your, your older brother, he's mm -hmm. our sort of preferred child. And we had you, so you could provide organs to him. No, I think uh, you're, you're, you're not going to have that conversation. The two siblings will have that conversation when the elder sibling uh, goes into dialysis. And they'll both be in their 30s, you would assume, at that point. It's not, no, you would never have that conversation. What if he needs a, a new child? heart? He only got one of those. Well, yeah, but that's not what he is genetically at risk for. Okay. So they were, you know, women in America right now, women are having their breasts removed if genetically they've got, what's it called, the, the uh, Burka marker, BRCA. Uh, we, this, this is going to be a very busy place this morning. We may, we may be in the middle of a tumult here in a few minutes. Well, I was going to turn the camera around, but it's, we're not going to be distracted. No. We're not going to be distracted. Uh, at any rate, you know, prophylactically, women are having their breasts removed. Uh, who's the cyclist? He had a testicle removed prophylactically. If you are at risk of certain cancers in America right now, insurance will pay for you to have that gland or that organ uh, removed. That's very turned. different from actually having children yeah. Bristly to uh, to harvest their organs. I'm I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable about that. Well, that's why I brought it up. <coughs> yeah, it is medicine today. My my uncle was a medical ethicist, and quite there's a chair at the University of Iowa College of Medicine named after him, the chair of medical ethics, because for a thousand years the Hippocratic oath was enough: do no harm. That was enough. Doctors could go their whole careers obeying just that one uh, prescription. But now, you know, end of life and beginning of life questions. When, when does a human life become a human life and consider to, all of that stuff? And, and do you, is it ethical? Is it a loving act to create a new child that might have the chance to save his older sibling's life? You know, it's, it's now we've got these questions and yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There are people writing books and dissertations trying to answer those questions and failing. 
anyway, anyway, uh, that was a heavy topic. Thank biohacker you for Brian Johnson, <laughs> who already has a cult-like following, uh, plans to start his own nation for anti-ages, where pizza, donuts, and alcohol could be illegal. It says here that the former tech mogul, now 46, says that anyone can join his new nation state, uh, and citizens would pool resources for access to therapies to ensure they don't die. And it also reminds us Brian Johnson is injected with blood from his 17-year-old son. So th this guy's sort of got priors, and he's spent his life trying to stay young. Yeah, I don't, this, the, the, the son is 17, so he cannot give informed consent, at least in the United States, for this procedure. The son cannot give consent. Typically, if a young, if, if somebody under 18 is donating an organ, I think parents give the consent. But in this case, it's the parent harvesting a renewable resource from a child. That, I think, is far more questionable than parents having a second child that might be able to save the life of the older child in their 30s. That but seems, is, is that, least, that whole uh, thing. But it's renewable. It is the renewable. The isn't. Sure. Well, you know, you, you stick a cow in a barn, you milk it every day. What's happening? If this kid, for instance, this kid wants to, 17-year-old, he wants to try smoking a cigarette. Now that nicotine's in his blood for days. What, what, what's dad going to say? Is dad going to say, no, I'm going to lock you in your room because that's my blood you're poisoning with nicotine. What the, I mean, that, of all that you've read about this guy so far, that jumps out at me. The kid's 17. He cannot give legal consent in the United States. Maybe they've bought an island. Where is this nation state he's creating? Well, let, let's just continue. Yes. And uh, now it would welcome people from across the world fighting to live longer and pull its citizens' resources to help everyone secure access to the tests, therapies and supplements they need to help de-age their bodies. And uh, things like eating donuts, pizza and eating junk food would be considered an act of violence. <laughs> Even alcohol would be off limits. <laughs> An act of violence, one uh, supposes that's an act of violence on oneself. If I eat a donut, I'm not affecting your lifespan. So it's like suicide. Suicide is illegal in the United States. Anyway, if you try to kill yourself, that is a crime. So I suppose in this case, these, these fitness police would arrest you for doing violence to yourself? I guess. I don't know. Does it say where it is? Where is this, this uh, nation state he has created? I think it's sort of uh, a bit like boontongs to start it's with. In it's, sort of, it's in his head. It's in his mind. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. it's going to be a nation of collective people and they, they could live anywhere in the world. But then again, there was photos in the actual article of this sort of utopia-like uh, place. So I think he is thinking that somewhere down the track that might Ugh. be... And I think they might be doing it here on Turtle Beach. Oh, I'd love to watch that. I would love to, and then see them all, you know, die in their 40s of genetic diseases that you can't exercise away. That they you wouldn't be able to have diet away. No banana cake at you know. Chip Fair Lele. La. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, my cousin Dave has been on my mind. My cousin Dave died recently from a whole assortment of cancers. And part of the theory, Dave's the same age as me, grew up on the same street as me, eating the same foods, drinking the same city water, going to the same schools as me. And here I am running around, riding a bicycle 20 kilometers every day, and poor Dave has, has died. And you know, why? Well, Dave was a fisherman in his youth. He used to love to fish by the Iowa River, and apparently he used to suck on lead sinkers while he sat there, the, the human uh, tongue uh, interprets lead as sweet. This is why babies eat lead paint. So it is thought, perhaps, that those many hours spent by the Iowa River sucking on a piece of lead, you know, did poor David in. And he was a hell of a nice guy, and it's a real shame that he died so young. He was the uh, same age as me, roughly. But what do you do if somebody comes into your, your little collective there and they say, you know, when I, was, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I was sitting by the Iowa River sucking on lead sinkers. 
do you let them in? Because they're going to screw your statistics. That guy's going to die young, mm. and and then your your little utopia will look less attractive because your statistics, the age of the people. So what do you do? Do you have a do you, do you test people, test their blood, ask oh, yeah. their medical history? You're 92 with advanced cardiac disease. Oh, I want to come into yeah. your uh, utopia. Yeah. Do you let him in? Right. All the damage has been done. Do you still let him in? Because that his death will reflect on your crazy project. That's all more interesting. Now, to me. Th this is the point uh, that I, I got from this, and th there's a female version of him which we'll allude to in a moment. Uh, in fact, we might just uh, have a quick look at her first. And uh, Kayla Barnes is the female Brian Johnson, but of course uh, without a Johnson. I suppose we needed a female. Brian Who wants Johnson. to live forever? Perhaps not forever, but a, a longer, healthier life at the very least. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past year, you'll probably be familiar with the rising popularity of longevity training. Uh, I don't think you're aware of longevity training. No. I'm no. thinking. Uh, it's not to say that the average person There's can't Carlo. dabble in it with a growing number of health clinics and wellbeing destinations around the world offering travelers the insight they might be craving. LA-based Kayla Barnes, CEO of Live the Wellness Space. And uh, this is some of the things she does in her daily routine. Uh, absence of alcohol or restaurant, restaurant dining. Uh, the most common negative comment that she receives is that she can't have any joy in life due to the strictness of the protocols. And she also checks her vitamin D levels, uh, <clears throat> taking supplements or using high quality air purifier in the bedroom. So th these people are doing all these things and a whole lot of other things not even described in these articles in order to try and live a little bit longer. Mm. And I'm wondering if you sort of lose the essence of life by spending so much time yeah. concerned about this issue. What do you do? What do I do? To Abs extend your life. Well, I, I, absolutely nothing. As I've said, I came here expecting to die in a year. Uh, every day I wake up surprises the living hell out of me. But a more interesting thing to me, that article began with the phrase, uh, who wants to live forever? To me, to my mind, what's, what's really interesting is Freddie Mercury singing at Live Aid, who wants to live forever? What no movie is it from? Huh? What movie is it from? Oh, isn't it uh, 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 Buck Rogers? Buck Rogers in the 23rd century? No. no What's no, it no. from? Highlander. Oh, right. Highlander. Oh, God, I love the Highlander franchise. Sure. Well, but I love the first movie. The there can be weird. only one. Oh, one Sean movie. Connery as the Spanish guy, the conquistador. Oh, my God, what a film. What a film, Highlander. Most but right. to the point... Who, uh, a Freddie Mercury singing to 100,000 people in a worldwide audience of a billion people, who wants to live forever, knowing he was in his last months, knowing that that that, that was it, he'd, he'd had it, that, that was, he was at the end of the race, and he comes out and he sings, who wants to live forever? My God, that is fascinating to me. That is That has more appeal to me than all of these gurus saying, you know, do X, do more reps, lower weight, more reps. No, do more weight, fewer reps. I mean, all of that does not interest me as much as the human tragic, uh, beautiful, the, the human soul transcending death on stage in front of a billion people. That, that's the kind of live forever I want. So, <clears throat> I'll ask you the question. You, you can squeeze the duck any time. It shuts me up. You know it shuts I, me well, up. I can't touch the table because it's oh, a wobbly right. table. So it's uh, putting me off duck duty today. Do you want to live forever? Mm, no. Me, no. Uh, I'd be interested to see people's comments, but me, God, no. I, uh, Do you want to live forever? <laughs> uh, what would you change if you suddenly were could wake up and do you want to get get your water? Oh, I was. You can't really get your water because no. you, you're connected to the. I put it too far away. We're afraid to put water on the table now, folks. Y you can have this one. I haven't oh, touched it yet. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now I can't drink it. I'll get one of Steve's many diseases. No, don't put it on the table. Give it back to me. <laughs> Keep it away from the laptop. Drops. So yeah, uh, what would you change if you suddenly woke up and you found that you could live forever? What would you suddenly do? Start doing different? No, oh. you'd, you'd start planning, I, I suppose. I'd start trying to kill myself. <laughs> I, uh, 
Uh, you know, it's a, it's a favorite uh, 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 trope in fiction, uh, particularly uh, uh, Robert A. Heinlein wrote a series of books about a guy named Lazarus Long who couldn't die. And what he does is he goes around trying, oh, uh, who, Daredevil, not Daredevil, who's the, the, the Ryan Reynolds uh, um, MC Universe? Dead Pool. Uh, Deadpool. Deadpool. The whole joke is that the guy goes around trying to die. He wants to die because who wants to live forever? I mean, how boring, how dull would that be? I'd and give it a go. See, you'd see everybody you love die. All but your children die. But you'd All have your, more children and Yeah, and watch them friends. die and watch them die. Uh, New Amsterdam, there was a TV show in America called New Amsterdam about a cop, a New York City cop who, uh, oh, and Highlander. Highlander's the same thing, isn't it? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, the immortals. Hence they wrote the song. Hence they wrote the song. Yes. And the immortals, what are the immortals doing in, in Highlander? They're constantly trying to cut off each other's heads because that's the only way they can die. So in a sense, philosophically, they're helping each other out. When I cut off your head and absorb all of your immortal energy, I'm, I'm helping you out. I'm helping you go on to whatever's, whatever's next. Boy, I got deep, deep today. Deep, deep, deep. So uh, what do you do in regards to, uh, to Mr. Brian Johnson? Do you want to go and live in his city? Uh, do you want to um, not drink alcohol, not have pizzas or donuts yeah. ever because they're acts of violence? Do you want this guy you've never met telling you every single day, every moment of every day, how to live your life? He'll have a heart attack at 50 or something. Well, James Fix, wasn't it James Fix, the guy who popularized running, jogging in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. And the man behind died the, the Pritikin diet. Is he? Nathan Pritikin, who oh, uh, right. espoused the Pritikin diet, which is Morning. no salt, no sugar, no oils. He died at a very early age, too. Yeah, so that, that you know, irony, irony. Uh, I, I would not want it. I would not want this guy, this zealot. I would not want any zealot of any sort, religious, physical fitness, political, any zealot telling me what to do 24-7. And um, we're going to be talking about red flags because red flags were one of your topics a few weeks ago. Mm. Uh, you got a couple more red flags from our viewer. Our viewer. Yes, thank you, viewer. Uh, yeah, these are uh, one I think we might have had before uh, when he tells you she's not like these other girls. I think that was one of yours originally. Oh, perhaps. Oh, she's not like yeah. that. Oh, no. That, that, I think that will always be at the top of the list as the number one Thailand That's red flag. That's a red flag, flag about the yeah. person saying it, not the girl. The other one was if somebody approaches you, if a Thai man approaches you or a woman approaches you in the street and they have very, very good English and they strike up a conversation with you for no apparent reason, just because you happen to be on the same street corner it's or in usually, the same bus. Where are you going? Yeah. Hi. Uh, where are you going? How long have you stayed in Thailand? Are you interested in gems? Do you know that today there's a special offer? The Thai government is allowing students to buy gems at much reduced prices. Yeah, keep you know, walking. Come with me to my brother-in-law's gem store, and you get a real good deal on rubies from Burma, you know, or jade from China. Yeah, any of that. If they speak very good English and they approach you in the street for no apparent reason, walk away. Yes. So those are our two red flags today. If you've got any more red flags. Uh, boy, this place is filling up yes. rapidly. We are trendsetters. Well, because since the program started, they've been watching, and I thought, oh, we better head down and yeah. see Steve and Tim. Yeah. Um, oh, now this is interesting. Yesterday, I drove past your house, mm. and there was a shiny new Som Somlo. Samlo. Samlo. Sam. Out the, out the front of your, yes. which is a motorbike connected to a uh, like a little trolley. Yeah. which has got one wheel, so you've got one, two, three wheels. Mm -hmm. oh, Sam Law, okay, there you go. Is law mean wheels? Yeah. Three wheels? Yeah, Sam Law. Makes sense. There's another word, there's a traditional word for uh, when there used to be like what we would call a pedicab, uh, a wheel in front and two wheels behind, and the guy would pedal in front and you would ride in the back in the basket. There is a word for that kind of three-wheeler, which I'm sure our, our viewers will contribute, but that, that word I don't remember. But so, yeah. So the Samlor, you see them everywhere mm. in Thailand and a lot of people use them to drag everything from 
Grand Mart, the daily supplies yeah. to uh, the, the water. The poor man's pickup. Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're everywhere. They are illegal, but they are everywhere mm. and they're ubiquitous. And uh, you could say that the Thai economy would not function yeah. without them. But what happened with Chumna? Well, I think this is, uh, you know, Steve is still learning. So it's kind of a long story. Settle in, get your water, uh, grab Bob the Duck. Uh, so when I first came here for six months, I lived behind the Lotus. A guy they call the Atan, the professor, was my uh, uh, landlord. <clears throat> he introduced me to Cham Nan. I said, I need a guy with a, a Samla to help me move to my new place down here on the beach. He said, okay, well, here's the guy, my man, my, the guy who works for me, Cham Nan. Cham Nan helped me move. And you since pinched then, his man. I did. Ah. Chamnan makes much more money doing much easier things. Yesterday I had Chamnan tear up a bunch of newspapers into strips. He spent an hour sitting behind the house in the shade in front of a fan, watching his phone, tearing up newspapers for Steve's paper mache products. This is much easier than cutting palm, cutting weeds, cutting rubber, any of the things the Achan has him do. So most days he comes to my house. He does not go to the Achan's house. Well, it turns out, now the Achan, by the way, when I did a header on Boxing Day a year and a half ago, and I landed on my face in the street, and I ended up with five stitches in my face, it was the Achan who that's, was... That's a face plant. That's a face plant. It's yeah. the scorpion. When your legs come up over the back of your head, that's the scorpion. I did that right here at this intersection, right yes. at this three-way. And... Uh, it was the Achan. He had come out to jog or walk in the morning. He was right there. He saw me face plant. He put me bleeding profusely, put me in his car and took me to the hospital. And I, I owe him a lot for that. I very much appreciate that. But uh, he said to Chamnan after about 18 months, look, if you're not working for me, apparently Chamnan Samlo belonged to the Achan. And the Achan was letting him use it. Uh, but now that Chamnan spends every day at my house, uh, that apparently the Achan said, I want my Samla back. Is the Achan a wealthy, influential figure locally? He is, by local standards, both wealthy and influential. Okay. He has a big piece of land he lives on. Uh, he has a bunch of rental units like what I was uh, in. God knows what else he has. But he why has... Would he give he, a da well, sorry, why would he give a damn about a 10,000 baht? Some law. Well, oh, well, uh, first Base. of all, let me finish with, he has 12 fruit trees on his property, one of each variety of fruit, so that every month he will have a different signature fresh fruit produced on his own property. This is, in South Thailand, traditionally how you would judge the wealth of a man. Does he have all 12 trees on his property? Uh, the Achan does. And what other businesses he might have, I don't know. What is the value of 10,000 baht to him? I know he gets really upset when a local dog kills one of his chickens. I know that. So it's, it's face. I think there's a, I certainly think there's a facial component. I did not know that Sam Law, the motorcycle and sidecar belong to uh, the Achan. So Chamnan shows up. He's, he's on his wife's motorcycle. He says, Con Steve, I don't have a, and everybody in the neighborhood is asking my wife, what happened to the Samla? What happened between Chamnan and the Atan? Right, it's a small town. Gossip is everything. So, uh, oh, Kun Steve, I'm losing face. Everybody in the neighborhood, what do I do? All right, I'm, I know my role in this little opera of three acts. My role is to buy him a new Samla. If he's going to work for me, buy him a new Samla. You might say, well, Steve, why don't you buy yourself a Sam Law? Let him use it, then it is yours, because I'm Falang. And I can't afford it. I live on my Social Security. I get uh, 1,500 US every month. So I told him on the 6th, when my Social Security check comes in, <clears throat> I can buy you the sidecar, and you can hook it on your wife's motorcycle. I cannot buy you a motorcycle and a sidecar. And he was ecstatic with that. He was very, very happy with that. So yesterday, it's 10,000 baht, if you're interested. 10,000 baht for a new sidecar. 300 bucks. And the, and the dude hung it on the, the motorcycle and said, yeah, well, you know, when Steve gets his social security, come pay me, because it's a small town. Wow. Chamnan and this guy probably went to school together. They're Generous. married. Yeah, you know, married sisters or cousins, whatever. It's a small town. So the guy said, yeah, I'll do the work for you, and you pay me come the 6th of April. So, yeah, I learned a few things about 
how everything you do here will have repercussions beyond your awareness. You, uh, you're changing people's lives by giving them this money, by hiring them to do these jobs, and then that is the circles going out from a rock dropped in a, in a well. It's, it's, you're affecting other people's lives and other people's lives, and there will be waves coming back at you. So, you know, be ready for that. Be ready for repercussions for everything you do. <clears throat> and the look on Chamnan's face. He, he knows it's his, right? He knows Steve's. Steve doesn't own a sidecar. Steve paid for it. Steve doesn't own it. And Chamnan will be very happy to use it to help me whenever I need it. But if I ask him, oh, and I love riding around in the Sam Law. There's nothing better. We put a big plastic chair in the Sam Law. I smoke a bunch of broccoli. And, and he'll take me to Kokloi. He'll take me to Kowlak to go toy shopping. Oh, no. Do you put oh, a helmet God. on? Oh, I put on a helmet and sunglasses. And I Does cover... he put on a helmet? Yes, he puts on a oh, helmet because well. the cops require it. You two uh, heading down to Kokloi. Oh. You with a fag hanging out in one side of your mouth and a hanging onto your helmet with the other hand, it would be quite a sight. Well, it is, and it happens once or twice a week. We'll just go have noodles. The best noodle joint is halfway from here to uh, the hot springs. So we'll go and, and, and uh, go have noodles. Just go have noodles in the sidecar. Uh, it's terrific. These roads, that all these bicyclists come here to ride on that road, and I go down that road in the Samla two, three times a week. And it's gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. And it I is. recommend it. I recommend it highly. If I could have afforded to buy the guy a motorcycle, I'd have bought him a motorcycle. He's a good friend. He's a good employee, let's say. Uh, it is a transactional relationship, but we're together every day. And he helps me out a lot. And I enjoy his company. And he teaches me a lot of Thai. And uh, I'd buy him a motorcycle if I, if I could afford it, just as a birthday gift. But uh, I can't afford that. And he knows. He sees how I live. He sees my money. He, he knows how I live. There's no hard feelings that I could buy in the sidecar and not the motorcycle. So that's the uh, tale of Chamnan's Chariot. Chamnan's Chariot. I like that. It's a beautiful piece of equipment. It's painted beautifully. The wires for the... First of all, it's got taillights, which the old one did not have. And the wiring for the taillights goes through the piping. It's not exposed. The wiring's Ooh. not exposed. Yeah, Fancy. It's, a, it's a gorgeous piece of work. And the connections, the three points it connects to the bike are rock solid. And uh, it's a, it's a gr for 10,000 baht, I think it's very good value. Yeah, brand new wheels, new hubs, new uh, 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 axle, new everything. Brand and galvanized. New galvanized, painted a beautiful silver. Uh, it's, it's just a gorgeous piece of work. So um, the next topic I had on my list and I think it's the final topic, is about beach cleaning. Mm. Now, you do your own version of beach cleaning, yeah. especially... Beach combing. During the... the beach combing. The, the, the wet season when yes. we get the bigger waves and we get more, more trash. detritus when the washing wind, up on the, the beach. When the wind is out of the west, it pushes it all this way. This time of year, it's pushing it all to Sri Lanka. Uh, but it all comes back. It all comes back every year. Sure. Uh, and I was wondering... Because apart from you, you're only just one person, uh, an amazing specimen that you are. Uh, what happens with all the trash? Where does it actually go? Yeah, I would love to visit the landfill. I assume there's a landfill. Do they, does I, somebody collect it? Oh, yeah. Do, do they actually have, the, does the orbitor go down and pick up the trash? Or do Off they have, the beach? Yeah. Oh, here, yes, about two kilometers here in front of the, the, the restaurants. Yeah, in front of the guest houses and the bungalows, yeah. Uh, twice a I've week. I've never seen them. Well, it happens very, very, very early in the morning. And remember, it's very quick because if you've cleaned the beach, all you're cleaning now is what came in on the last tide. So that's, okay. that's relatively little. I, when I go all the way down to the Kaunayak, the headland at the end of the beach, I'm picking up trash that's been there four or five years. Uh, this trash is, is replaced every high tide twice in 24 hours. Now, it's not the, the cleanest beach in Thailand, but generally it's not bad at the moment. The worst thing is because of the easterly winds this time of the year, they blow all the needles off the casuarina trees yeah. and it was sort of we get that uh yeah that's that year round those things brownish shed. Look. those yeah. things shed all year round and they eventually always. sort of vanish yeah. but i'm just wondering who apart from yourself who is picking up the trash you're telling me that they're actually troops of people going out yeah and, okay well i've never that seen morning them. also on the 20th of every month you can go down to the gate of the the uh park 
and there's a big public uh, cleanup of the couple kilometers, anywhere that's public, anytime you're in front of a hotel on the beach, they clean it every morning. Anytime you're in front of a government office, which we have several, we have university, high school, land office, Obata, and in front of those places, it'll be cleaned. And at the gate to the national park, they clean the beach on the 20th of every month. You can go there, it starts at, I think, 6.30 in the morning. Because if you're going to be on the beach, you've got to get it done by 9 or 10. It's got to be it's done. It's too hot the sun, Yeah, the sun yeah. will kill you. Uh, but yeah, and we can go the tw 20th of April. Well, uh, what's uh, Songkran? I don't know if Songkran will affect the schedule. But I, if you would like, my friend Hans and I go. And, sure, I'll and, be happy to go. They give you a big old rice sack. And the Thais, what's interesting is the Thais all do it in a big group, right? And they chatter, they talk, they Mostly have snacks, chatter and they talk. sing. The two Falang, me and Hans, <laughs> we're walking along, head down, not speaking uh, to uh, each uh, other, uh, doing our own thing, right? Sure, sure. Very Western. Uh, interesting that in a lot of, um, Australia's got a lot of beaches. Really? So, yes, I, it, I had not it, heard it, that. It is a big, big island, which has got beaches all around it. Mm -hmm. And I used to see a lot of, um, they're called beach groomers. They're sort of like yeah. a, a small combine harvester towed mm -hmm. behind a tractor. And the, the beach gets sort of dug up and the sand falls out and the, the trash stays in there and mm -hmm. eventually gets removed. It's called a beach groom, and they go one way, they go the other way, and the beach is pretty much clean. Yeah. I was thinking that we could get a beach groomer here, but you're assuring me that they've actually got it pretty well organized yeah. already. Well, I'm astonished. Well, yeah, I've I, never I, seen them. I don't know what that would cost, a beach groomer, but you realize everybody in this village, nobody pays property taxes. There's no chinote. So no, nobody, okay. there's no nobody paying property taxes. That would in well, there's in electricity office. bills. Oh my God! Yeah. Last month. Well, that's yeah, we're running the air Damn conditioning. Damn guests at night, using the so, air conditioning. Yeah. Oh my God. But at any rate, yeah, it it is uh, uh, in public places. It is it is kept fairly clean. Yeah. Well, I'm and I'm may, amazed. May I say, the the terms beach cleaning and beach combing. What I do is beach combing. I don't pick up every piece of trash. In fact, I was criticized Ooh. by a tourist lady because I picked up a water bottle, took the top off the water <laughs> bottle, the dropped water the bottle back, back on down. the beach, and <laughs> put the cap in my pocket. And she, this woman educated me on how you clean a beach. Well, I'm not cleaning the beach. It is not my purpose to clean this beach. My purpose is to collect free art materials off this beach. So bottle caps, net floats, things that are brightly colored, plastic, uh, that's what I collect, and I step over everything else. Uh, clear plastic bags I collect because uh, turtles will eat them. Yes. So clear baggies I will collect, and nets, ghost nets, I will pull them as far up the beach as I can. And, and try those six-pack plastic things that hold the, the six-pack, yeah. yeah, they're I've very never, dangerous. I've never seen one of those on this beach. Interesting, I haven't either. But the nets I'll pull up above the high tide mark and put them in the trees and the weeds to try to keep them out of the water. Other than that, no, I'm very selective. I pick up very specific things. So that's beach combing. Well, seeing that we are on Thailand's longest beach, uh, <laughs> I'm going to watch. Hang on to that. I'm going to watch with interest uh, over this wet season to see uh, what happens out the front of my section mm. of the beach because I'm at the Paris end of uh, yeah, you uh, are. Turtle Beach. You are compared to the poorer end. Dude, I I encourage you uh, to either comb or clean. Uh, old rice bags are are cheap. And you can leave it by the yellow tubs. You have the yellow, you know, there's a garbage truck, by the way. We would be happy, by the way, if there were more rubbish bins provided. It's oh, not well. a strong thing in Thai culture, rubbish well, bins. Well, it costs money. You know, yeah, you've you got to, to pay. collect them and you empty to, them. And no, you have to pay to get one in front of your house. So everybody goes down to the first public place that's got, got a yellow bin. And, and drop your trash in the... And so your neighbors are using your bin. Oh, absolutely. All of those ladies you have antagonized are using your <laughs> bin. Um, the, uh, when we got the, uh, the, the vendors setting up uh, each... Mainly on the weekends, we got all the sort of the food stalls set up. And they just come across the road and yeah. put the rubbish in the bins. Yeah, sure. And I'm just sort of standing there looking at them going... Yeah. Uh, no, don't think anything of it. But at least they're putting it in a bin, even if yes, I'm paying for exactly. it. Yes, exactly. That is the important point. You're going to pay the same price for that bin, whether they drop their... Good morning, Kill. Sure. Oh, showed up for work. <laughs> uh, they, 
uh, you're you're going to pay the same price whether that bin is half full or completely full or overflowing. So, do you have the concrete rings around your bins so that dogs like this one don't don't tip over your garbage cans? No, bins? no, uh, because usually I keep them inside the gate. Oh, and, and then drag them um, out on I trash drag day. them out on trash day. <laughs> What's this one called? Does it have a name? No, I don't know. Probably I dum. Black dogs are always called I dumb in this country. I've had uh, two cats called dumb. Yeah. Uh, they were black, they, by the uh, way. Yeah. They, they don't put a lot of effort in the nickname. <laughs> Uh, and with that, we thank you very much for watching. Oh, you is can, that it? Yeah, that's oh, all. Okay. I've got other things to do. Uh -huh. um, Antagonize more local ladies. <laughs> I didn't antagonize them. The most them. powerful group of women in this village. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're making much more of this than actually. Okay. All right. <laughs> Fine. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, Steve has a channel, which is Steve Ross with an... E on, e the on the end. With an e. uh, just the same as the word antagonize. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for joining us today. Subscribe to Steve's channel and we'll see you next time. And thank you for the invitation. I'm always flattered and very pleased when you invite me on your channel. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.